It is real. The warfare is real. The warfare is real. But as you sit in Jesus, it says in Ephesians 2, 6, that we are seated with him in heavenly places. Oh, this is such a big deal. It says to set your mind on things above in Colossians 3, is that you have been crucified with Christ and you no longer live, but the life that you live, you live by faith in the one that gave himself for you. Galatians 2.20, this is so powerful. The whole Bible is full of this. It's full of men and women of faith that pressed in Old Testament men and women of faith that pressed in New Testament, everything changes. John the Baptist, he's out there proclaiming, make a straight path for the Lord to travel. He's proclaiming and he's, he's getting ready. We're getting ready to close out a, an old covenant and open up a brand new one. And it says this in scripture, it says that he who is least, says that John the Baptist was the greatest of all Old Testament prophets. Now listen, I want you to understand that Elijah called down fire. Elijah called down fire on the prophets of Baal, on Mount Carmel. And all these prophets, they cut themselves, they, they danced, they screamed, they chanted, because their God wasn't real. Baal never answered that day. He never answered, ever. Because he can't answer because he's not real. A God that's not real can't answer. So they were calling on him all day long. They built an altar. That altar was built, and, and Elijah said at the beginning of this challenge, which really wasn't a challenge, he said, whatever God answers is the God that's real. If it be Baal, then worship Baal. If it be God, then worship God. And he built this, they built this all, he said, you guys go first. Elijah is teasing and says, maybe your God is like sleeping. Maybe he just can't hear you. Maybe yell louder. Yelling louder isn't gonna wake up a God that's not real. Maybe your God's like going to the bathroom, he's busy. So they got really angry and started chanting louder and screaming louder and men, they're cutting themselves, hoping that maybe their God answers, but that God can't answer. And Elisha is like, are you guys done yet? Are you done? Okay, he's not even gonna use their sacrifice. He builds an altar out of stone. This is amazing to me. I'm looking at these guys, and they, they had such faith. We've got something much greater than what they had. We had the promise that was reserved for us. This is nuts. We have something so much greater than what they had. We have the promise. Like, the promise that they couldn't have, it says that they saw it. It was in front of them, and they prophesied about this day that was happening. And now we're in that day. It says, you know, nothing as strong as God's love. It says the perfect love of God casts out not some fear, all fear. Every bit, every bit of fear is cast out. That means if you have fear, that means the perfect love of God hasn't set in. Uh, this isn't like, this isn't like me pointing the finger. I'm telling you, fear is the opposite of real love. God's love. Jesus wasn't afraid. Are you with me? He's on the earth. He's all hell is against him. Like all hell is against him. He's not like, man, what am I gonna do? He had confidence. He had confidence in his God. Elijah had confidence in his God. I mean, confidence that like when he built that altar and he cut up that bull and, and everything is there and everything's set. He's like dump water on it. Dump water on it again. Now do it again a third time and it's tr the trenches are overflowing with water. And the prophets of Baal, I guarantee you, are laughing and mocking. Just like Noah. They laughed and mocked Noah. Noah didn't get mocked for a day. No Noah didn't get mocked for a month. Noah didn't get mocked for like a year. Noah got mocked for a hundred years. A hundred years he's building a boat that God says to build because it's gonna be the end and everybody came and taunted him. A hundred years of no rain. You're building a boat in the middle of the land that has no rain. Are you foolish? Foolish. 
man, more than, like more than foolish to most because the way that seems right to a man is destruction. But not Noah, see, he kept building and kept building and kept building and kept building and kept building. And on that day, all the ones that mocked were the ones scratching at the doors. And God has these great men and women of faith over history. Elijah says, okay, God, show them who's real. Boom, and the fire came. It didn't just like burn up the offering, it burned up the rocks. How much fire would burn up rocks? Like I've, been, I've had bonfires before. How many of you have had bonfires before? Those rocks don't change, they just get dark. No, 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 we're talking about rocks like disintegrating into nothing. Boom, and then these prophets of Baal didn't make it far because every one of them were killed that day. All of the mockers. That's intense, this is our God. Look at Gideon, Gideon is a man of faith. Gideon is like hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat. Not, you're not supposed to thresh wheat in a wine press, but he's, he's hiding there for fear of the Midianites. And God's like, he sees Gideon's potential. He doesn't call out his failures. He's like, rise up you mighty man of valor. Gideon's like, ay, 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 ay. are you kidding? I'm serious. God sees us and he knows and he has mercy on us, but he knows that we're more than conquerors. He knows stuff that we don't know. He's way smarter than we be. But God sees our potential. And being born again is essential, but it's unlocking your potential. These songs we were singing were about authority and seated with him and oh my gosh, I'm over there going, God, this is all powerful. But a lot of the body of Christ is like Gideon, just going about life, doing their jobs, doing stuff, going shopping without Jesus. And we're afraid to share our faith because we're afraid someone might get upset at us. And it just shows the depth of love deficit. I'm not making fun of anybody, I'm telling you like it is. God didn't say that evangelists were the only people who were supposed to share their faith. He said that evangelists and pastors and teachers and prophets and all these different fivefold gifts, they're all to equip the saints for the works of ministry. That doesn't mean like people that are going after full-time ministry. That means that when you said yes to God, you left that place of horrible sinner to actually got saved by grace through faith saved you and now you've been justified by faith and you have peace with God. If that peace with God hits you, you are at war with the enemy. Now you were on his, you were on the devil's team in darkness. You didn't even know it because he blinds people. The God of this world blinds the eyes of those lest they should see. Second Corinthians 4:4. 4, 4. He blinds the eyes lest they should see the light that's in Christ. But man, when that light comes, boom! It's, there's something that happens. But what happens is sometimes we we go from here and we're on our way to here, not knowing that we're already there. So we're going through this process of just, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm growing, but really what you're doing is you're being attacked. When you ask somebody, hey, how you how you doing? Well, you know. No. How you doing? Well, you know, bro. I mean, I, I got this and I got that. No, do you got Jesus? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course I do. But and then all of a sudden, this is bigger than this. And our situations be, are bigger than our God. And our crisis is bigger than our Christ. And then all of a sudden, we're not in Christ, we're in crisis. Wondering, hey, when's it gonna stop? And we blame God for lots of different things that God didn't do. Can I read a section of scripture to you? I'm going to, whether you want me to or not. I have so many different things I wanna talk about. A little time to do it. Oh, I am provoked, buddy. I was down with, with Daniel Kalinda at CFAN, and you know, and uh, it's my first time down there with, with, uh, with Reinhardt passing, with him not being there. And <laughs> I loved him so much, what he stood for, what he carried. He carried this confidence, like I've rarely seen his confidence, this power of the gospel that I've rarely seen. I mean, he carried such an anointing. 
for bringing people to Jesus. Like, I'd be in the meetings and he would preach and I'd be like, I need to get saved. And I'm safe, but man, he just, the heart gets so convicted. Oh my God, I, I've got to do this. I've, I've got to say yes again. And I'm like, right, aren't you? when I talk to him, I'm like, you, you, you made me want to get born again. He told you already, born. I know, but I feel like you preached the gospel fresh to me. I just heard it again. And he had this anointing on his life to preach the gospel in such a way to where on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached the gospel, for the first time, this one that was petrified, this one that was afraid, this one that denied Jesus, this one that was called by Jesus, get behind me, Satan. Not because he practiced witchcraft, not because he did seances, but because he had in mind the things of man and not the things of God. <laughs> Jesus opened the heavens. And when the Holy Ghost was poured out, the heavens opened over all of us. They're not closed anymore. The only closed heaven is between our ears. I'm the devil doesn't have the right to close a heaven. He can't touch the heavens. If God opened them. See, when the Holy Ghost came down with Jesus, when he went down to that river Jordan, it says that the heavens were open. That word open is the word rend. That word rend is torn. They were torn over Jesus just for him because he's the only one that became right with it. He was the only one that had the ability to be right with God because he never sinned. And on the day of Pentecost, God rent the heavens and the Holy Ghost was poured out. Mighty rushing wind. Why? Because the heavens were ripped open for mankind. Amazing. And they were endued with power from on high. Power not to build a ministry, Power not to be cool or be above people. Power to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Preach the gospel. So Peter preaches the gospel of the kingdom with his power that came from God. And when Jesus says, my word to you is both spirit and life, that same thing came out of Peter. Because it was God the Holy Spirit that was speaking through Jesus. Now God, the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 11, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now dwelleth in you and will quicken your mortal body. So now Peter preaches that same gospel, but it's different. He preaches the gospel and it says in Acts 2 that these guys were cut to the quick. They were mocking. They were mocking. These men are drunk with wine. They're, come on guys, this is crazy. And then bam, Peter delivers this thing. And they're like, oh. and then he says this at the, at the close of this, you killed Jesus. Oh, they were cut, they were pierced, they were cut to the quick. And that word cut to the quick, pierced, means their conscience. Their conscience was cut. Meaning that thing, the conscience, the very place that sin defiled. That's the first place that a born again believer needs to get free from. The conscience, the memory of sin, the emotions, all that stuff that has been completely traumatized by the world. Jesus wants that thing, boom, completely clean so that God has a blank canvas to write on. The soul, the mind, the will, the emotions. So what happened was their conscience was cut. And they went, ah, oh, we're guilty. What do we do? This is amazing. What a great place to be. Peter didn't make it hard. He's like, repent. Repent. Change the way you think. You have to turn and change the way you're thinking. You have to change the way that you're thinking. It's not just, I'm sorry. It's an actual about face, thinking from things from God's perspective instead of your old perspective. Are you with me? If Peter had issues with dealing with all the voices of denying Jesus. Wow, that's a heavy, that's a real heavy. Can you imagine having to go through life remembering that you denied Jesus to your faith, to his face? When you walk with him, that would be too heavy. There's no way to live through that. That condemnation is worse than any of the stuff we're going through, I promise you. Imagine Paul's condemnation that he would be dealing with, killing Christians, first Christian martyr. Imagine that right there rolling through Paul Saul and the name got changed to Paul. Imagine that rolling through his soul. He could never get this thing on with Jesus. There's no way. 
That thing had to be clipped and cut out and completely annihilated in order for him to think clearly to receive from the Lord. It's so huge. Are you with me? Uh, it says that the prophets prophesied about a day to come. They couldn't have it. They were seeing a day when we were gonna receive it. They were pressing in. They were all pressing in. Noah, Samson, all these guys saw something ahead, all of them. And it says that Elijah, with all that he did, and all these different prophetic people, all of them, God's prophets, Jonah, all of them, all of them, they saw it was for us. And it says that John the Baptist was the greatest of Old Testament prophets. John didn't call down fire and crush anything. John didn't do this, John didn't do that. No, but John said this, repent for the kingdoms at hand. Jesus is coming, it's time to change. You have to change, you have to change, you have to change. So Jesus comes down to the River Jordan and John the Baptist's life, everything that he was prepared for was at the River Jordan right there. Jesus comes down, behold the Lamb, the Lamb. Oh my gosh, the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Behold, Jesus is like, John, I need you to baptize me. Oh, you're coming to me, but I need yours. But Jesus couldn't give John that one because that one was reserved for us. Jesus couldn't give John the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus couldn't do that for John, why? Because that spirit wasn't gonna be, the Holy Ghost wasn't gonna be poured out until the Son of Man was lifted up, until the day of Pentecost. So John says, I need your baptism, you come to me. No, Jesus said, let it be how, it needs to be now, let it be, it's necessary, so that righteousness gets fulfilled. So John the Baptist continues and baptizes Jesus. He goes down into that river Jordan and the Holy Spirit goes upon Jesus, rest in and remain. Are you guys with me? There is a thing that I get called a heretic for more than any other doctrine. I'm gonna preach it right now. Again, because it's real. I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me correctly. It's very important. God was just, I was in the closet for, for almost three hours today with Jesus and he kept speaking the same thing, the same thing over and over and over and over. Over and over and over and over. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were told one thing, don't eat the tree. The day you do it, you surely die. I know you guys know the story. We've talked about it before. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it says, let us make man in our image and in the likeness of man, in the likeness of God, they made man. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's why he said, let us, because it's the Trinity. So they created man in his image. Let them have dominion, dominion, dominion over the beast, the field, over every creeping thing. Satan's a creep. So they had dominion. Are you with me? And he created a garden, a small place where, where his creation was going to stay. And outside of that garden, there was havoc and complete trauma, just chaos. And in that garden was a tree, and God said, do not eat this tree. The day you do, you surely die. Now, I want you to understand, it was their only, it was their only commandment. That's a pretty easy life. That's one commandment. That snake came in, and that snake got them to question. He couldn't take the keys of dominion from them. He could not take that dominion. Satan had to get them to question God to receive that. Are you with me? Just real quick, I'm gonna go through this. So Satan got them to question God. Eve ate the tree. Adam consented, Adam was there. Adam ate the tree too. And when God came to question them, because sin entered into the picture, fear entered into the picture. And when fear enters into the picture, you hiding enters into the picture. So they're hiding and God said, Adam, and Adam knew that God was there. And God knew where Adam was, but God wanted Adam, Adam to come out and speak for himself. Where are you? It's not like God like loses track. I promise he sees your everything. You think you can hide from God. I don't care if you make a, I don't care if you make your bed in, 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 in the bottom of the sea. Psalm 139 really defines it. Wherever I go, he's there. And you can't hide from him. It's amazing. Since he sees everything, we shouldn't have any secrets. 
Your secrets condemn you. Your secrets stop you from the secret place. Your secret and your junk that you don't think God sees stop you from seeking your father in secret because you've got too many secrets. But when you see the freedom that's in Christ, you don't want to have secrets. You want to be in the secret place with your father. Because watch, when you're in that place with your father, it may look like you're surrounded, but you're surrounded by him. <laughs> see, God is for you. He's not against you. And he is the best dad ever. And he is good. And he loves you. So Adam, where are you? I'm here, Lord. And he says, you eat the tree. Why, why, why are you wearing fig leaves? Adam was naked and didn't even know it. Now he knew it because sin came in. So now he closed himself and God's like, Adam, you ate the tree. Well, so you, yeah, but you made the woman. She, she ate it. And so she, it's, God, you made her. That's why I did it. He blames God. He says, is it true? You ate the tree. She said, well, you, you know, you, you made the snake. It's your fault. The Satan, I love this, the Lord, goes to the devil and says, because you've done this, you are cursed to crawl on your belly. That sounds like worthless to me. Yet how many Christians take up that identity? He didn't curse you. He cursed the devil. And in the garden, he's some snake. And in the book of Revelation, he's some seven-headed dragon. We made him that way by believing his lies. <laughs> You're cursed to crawl in your belly. And I'm gonna tell you, God says, the seed of this woman, you're gonna bruise his heel but he's gonna crush the head of your seed. There are seeds trying to reproduce themselves after their own kind. The devil is trying to reproduce his seed right here in you. You come to Jesus, you say yes to God. Do you think the devil backs off and goes, darn, let's go find somebody else. No, he's on that seed, why? Because he wants to make sure that he can twist this thing and mess this up. He doesn't want you to believe the gospel. He doesn't want you to understand what dominion means. He doesn't want you to. See, the Bible says that his heel, Jesus' heel was gonna be bruised, but he was going to crush his head. And the Bible says that the God of peace, that's our God, will soon crush Satan under our feet. That's what it says. That's what it says. That's what it says. That's the Bible. And God is not a liar, and he's not a man that he should lie. So, so here, so all of a sudden this comes. God clothes them with animal skins, blood covenant, sends them out of the garden, and man is now living by the sweat of his brow and worry and fear and all this stuff is in there. But fast forward to Luke 4. Jesus is at the River Jordan. This is the seed. This is the one, the promised one to come. Jesus is there. What is he there to do? He's to restore that which was lost. What was lost? Man's dominion was lost. Man's relationship with God was lost. There wasn't a voice for 400 years. John the Baptist is prophesying, and God says that there wasn't one born among women that was greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven. That's the born-again believer that has God's spirit resident inside of them. Yet he who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. We're talking about the high watermark of the whole Old Testament. But he says that he who is least, the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about people up above floating. He's talking about man who was created in the image of God, that lost dominion, that lost authority, that lost everything. Jesus came to restore that which was lost. This is such a big deal, because we've got to see it. So Jesus, you have to understand this. The doctrine that I am told that by people that I'm a heretic over is because I said that Jesus did what he did as a man when he was here. Let me just get something straight. In the beginning, the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus was with God in the beginning. So Jesus is fully the Son of God. He is fully God with us. He is fully Emmanuel. Jesus is the Son of God. Are you with me? But for a season, 
he willingly, willingly laid aside his divinity. You have to understand, he was fully God and fully man. He took on man's nature. He took on the nature of man fully when he came here. He wasn't born as God. He was born as God's son. But God's son had to take on humanity in order to be tempted at all points and in order to fulfill a covenant that God made with man and himself. You have to see this. This isn't heresy, this is the Bible. So Jesus did no miracles. Not one miracle was noted until after he was baptized in the River Jordan. Not one miracle, there's not one noted miracle. There wouldn't be, there couldn't be. Why? Because that was when God came upon Jesus. This is huge, why? See, when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, it says the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit came down and rested upon Jesus and remained. This is humongous, yeah? When I saw this, when I was just in the Bible, just got saved and I'm going through that time of praying for all these people and not, see, not seeing anybody healed, not seeing any breakthrough at all, didn't see any miracles, but I knew it was real because I saw somebody get healed that I didn't pray for someone else, Dan Muller prayed. I was so blown away. I'm like, I, I have to go after this with everything in me. See, I'm not a person that goes a little bit. My wife will tell you, I'm extreme. I have issues. Why? Because I don't, I'm not going after anything part way. I'm going after this the whole way. Jesus paid more of a price than just to rescue me away and get me to heaven. No, no, no. The devil manipulated me and maneuvered me my whole life and I didn't see it. He led me around by this nose ring as a slave to sin and I destroyed many people's lives and hurt many people and stole from many people and was hooked on many things. Many things. When Jesus saved me, he didn't just save me to get me there. He saved me to repossess that which was lost and my heart was lost and I was completely blind and I was completely hurting people and didn't even see it. I thought it was normal. I thought it was normal. Man, you grow up, it's normal to just get a girlfriend and sleep with her, man. Get another one and sleep with her. Get another one and sleep with her. It's normal. We don't even see it. It's just normal. It's not normal. But it is normal until Jesus comes. That's not normal once Christ comes. It's not normal, but it is normal in the world. It's just the way it is. It's the way that seems right to a man. Hey, man, got a girlfriend? Yeah, man, what's up? Go to the bar, look for another one. It's, that's normal. That's not normal in the kingdom. But Jesus has to open your eyes to make it not normal. So for me, I'm blind and I'm hurting people and destroying people. And then my conscience gets pierced and God goes, and actually to be pierced on that day when he preached the gospel, it says they were wounded in their conscience. That's what that cut to the heart means. I was wounded by conscience. My conscience was full of darkness and full of yuck and full of porn and full of all that stuff. And then God went and wounded me in my conscience. Ah! Oh my God, you're real. No, so for real. So for me, I saw that I was blind and hurting people, but God took those blinders off. That the God of this world blinded me for my whole life. He ripped those things off. And he gave me new lenses. He gave me the lens of Christ so I could see people through God. And I could see people through a creative value. But first I had to see myself. Because I was completely wretched and lost. And then God went, not guilty. And it was too good to be true. God, that can't, that can't be real. Like, God, I have to be just thinking this stuff. No, my son. And I saw the value that I had before the Father. And I went, oh my gosh. And you've been thinking about me before I was born. Because before my mom and dad came together, God was planning me. <laughs> when my mom was pregnant, he was knitting me in that womb. <laughs> and he knew I was gonna go down that road of destruction and hurt people. He knew it, but he still loved me. But I didn't know it, no one told me about it. My whole life, 34 years, no one told me. No one said, because everybody was afraid. And I was hurting people, and I was scary, and oh my gosh, they keep, keep
keep clear of him. But my Bible says Jesus was a friend of sinners. <laughs> he came for the sick. And I was as sick as you could get, man. And he's like, I want that one right there. Oh, and I go, oh my gosh, me? Yeah, you. Yeah, but don't you see what I've destroyed? Yeah, but look at what my son did. It's not a theory to me. I'm in love like God. God broke the shackles, broke the chains. And then he filled my mind with him. And he, he showed me how to set my mind on things above instead of things beneath. Life's not fun without Jesus, buddy. I thought Christians were just goody two-shoes and just, just think that they're holier than thou. <laughs> this is crazy. Jesus gets baptized in the River Jordan. No miracles had happened so far, none. I'm looking at this. Jesus is fully God, yet fully man, and chooses to come here to live as a man. And the Bible says that Jesus could do nothing of himself. John 5, 19. The Son can do nothing of himself, only that which he sees the Father do. For what the Father does, the Son does in like manner. So Jesus was so yielded. So we look at Jesus' life and I'm like, I'm looking at all this and I see this, that there's a couple of things about Jesus that have to match my life. Because when I look at Jesus, like all these miracles happened in his life. When he came out of the River Jordan, he went out in the wilderness, was tempted, the first temptation. First temptations. If you are the son, then change these stones into bread. Jesus, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the Father. Why? Because God just said, you are my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. So the last thing Jesus heard when he goes out there is, you're my son, in whom I'm well pleased. So the devil says, do something to prove it. I don't have to, God said. That's so powerful. But Jesus had attained righteousness, and when righteousness hits, it's the end. Because righteousness is what gives us peace. Righteousness is what gives us joy. This is huge. Your joy doesn't come from your day. Your joy comes from your salvation. How can you receive joy in the midst of a trial if you don't know who you are? How can you receive joy in the midst of a fire if you don't know who's in there with you? Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, these are Old Testament guys again. They are faced by Nebuchadnezzar, who is this vehement king that wants everybody to bow to his golden statue of him. And these boys ain't doing it. First, they weren't doing it with food. And then because they didn't do it with the king's meat and they ate only vegetables, they had countenance changed. Their countenance was better than everybody else. So they got promoted, so now they're promoted. These guys are like helping, they're like promoted, like Daniel, like promoted. And the king's like, they're in there and everybody else is bowing, they're like, ain't no way. No way, because that's not real. We serve a real God. And so they're faced with this thing and the king's like, is it true that you didn't bow? Because my people are telling me. And they're like, no king, we, we're not, we have no need to bow. No, 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 you don't understand. I will burn you and kill you if you don't bow. This is Old Testament. This isn't even with Jesus, but they saw what we were gonna receive. So they're pressing forward because for us, <laughs> I, could just, I can just see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in heaven going, come on! Daniel faces lions. Like this is all through the Bible faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God is a scripture. It's, I think it's Mark eleven twenty four. 24. That is have faith of God. Have the faith of God. Have the faith of God. So these boys are faced with their stained bow and they get on the edge. The furnace is there. It says the king was so mad he heated up seven times hotter and he killed his own men. He killed his own men. So my question is, if he killed his own man, how did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get in there? I believe they jumped in willingly. It says that the king killed his own men. I believe they jumped in there willingly. Look, 
what is your fire to us, O king? They jumped in and surely they're gonna die. The king is surely satisfied with the death of these boys, except there were four inside of there. You talk about faith, man. Faith facing a real fire, real fire. And they come out not smelling like smoke. It was the most, most intense conversion of all Old Testament history. Nebuchadnezzar was like, you have a real God. First he said, who shall save you from my fire? Boom, and then they're in there with Jesus. Oh. Come out. Yeah, what is it, King? It's all throughout history where a Christian's faith didn't waver and the people that were killing that Christian come to Christ because they didn't bow to anything. What a gospel. So Jesus comes out of that river Jordan, goes out, is tempted, comes back out in the Holy Ghost in power. The Holy Ghost in power. Goes about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. Jesus healed them all. My question is this, when you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was completely without sin and he was completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit. So my question is this, how much sin does the blood of Jesus cover? Some or all? Now, when I say that, people are like, what are you trying to say, you never sinned? No, I'm trying to say this. When I got saved, I believed I was forgiven. When I got saved, I believed that he came in me and he completely kicked out every bit of darkness out of me because God doesn't share the house. So when he did that, I spent time in the word every day, including today, and go after the fact of why he saved me. Because he didn't save me for me, he saved me for his sake. So that I could actually walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, believing that the blood of Jesus has cleansed me from all sin. Now, now people are like, well, does that mean you're never gonna sin? I didn't say that. If you miss it, you have a lawyer. It doesn't say that you have to. Are you, I, I need you to hear me, because I'll, I'll lose some of you right now. I can already see, I can already feel. What are you trying to say, man? I'm trying to say this. If your conscience has been washed by blood and you realize the value that you have before the Father and you realize that your sins and your lawless deeds, God says he remembers no more. And you realize the voice of a stranger that's trying to always bring up your past into your future so you can never be present. He's trying to bring up your past into your present so you can never step into the future. He's trying to always bring the stuff that you wish that you never did up here and get you to believe that it's really not finished. He wants you to believe it's to be continued. But if you were clean and you realized that your past didn't exist and you looked in the mirror with the unveiled face and you saw Christ in you, the hope of glory, staring back at you and you knew that you had confidence to approach the throne of grace and you knew that God wasn't gonna drudge up your junk but he sees you through his son and you saw that God is good and he's not mad and you understood what real grace was because grace empowers you to walk out what truth calls you to. The blood of Jesus is the cleansing agent of heaven. And God cleanses my conscience from dead works, Hebrews 9. How much more shall the blood of Jesus cleanse my conscience from dead works so I can serve God? But I'm not serving him out of a servant place. I'm serving him out of a son place. And I believe that he's my Abba and he's my father. This is huge. But what if you looked in the mirror and you didn't have guilt, shame, or condemnation? You wouldn't do things and step into things that bring guilt, shame, and condemnation. That's what holiness is. Holiness isn't doing holy. Holiness is being holy. If I'm right with God and I have peace with God, the last thing I want to do is interrupt that peace I have. If I'm right with God and I have peace with God and I can boldly approach the throne of grace in time of need, when's the last time I didn't need Jesus? I need to live there. Not super spiritualize this. Because super spiritual makes you so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. It makes you a Christian flake. 
were like, the Lord, you can't work. I don't need to work. The Lord wants me to just. That's, that's demonic. Well, the Lord doesn't want me to work. Read the Bible. Well, I did. And he told me I'm not supposed to work anymore. You got a family? Well, yeah. You got kids? Yeah. What are you going to do? Well, you know, the Lord told me not to work. Do you guys need to pay your bills? Yeah, but he's going to provide. Okay. How'd you do last month? Well, we're just believing. You need to get a job. I'm not being mean. Do your job as under the Lord and watch how he shows up. Are you with me? Some people don't like this. I don't care. When I got saved, I went to work and I worked like I worked like a, a I worked like a machine. And I made sure that people were getting healed when I was working. And I made sure that people were getting the gospel when I was working. And I didn't want a job with Christians. It's so weird. Man, I just need to, I'm just so done with these guys. They're heathen. Gosh, I need a I need to work around people that love the Lord. No, you need to work around devils so they leave. I'm not being mean. You find out who you are, you will be a light in a dark place. You will be a light in a dark place to where you can share your faith. The problem is that we don't share our faith, so we, we, we just, because we're afraid that, you know, when, they, when we share our faith, they're going to bark at us, they're going to make fun of us. I love Ben's testimony today about his boy. It's awesome. Where he's like, my son is at the table. Why? Because he's standing for righteousness sake. He's taking a stand for righteousness sake. Yeah, you're going to be made fun of. Why? Because blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. You're going to be persecuted when you believe that Jesus is the way, not a way. You're going to be persecuted when you believe that God wants to use you to heal the sick. You're going to be persecuted when you believe that when you have a prophetic word and you share it and, and people are like, yeah, whatever. But you have to trust God, that the anointing in and upon you is going to cut the heart of the people that you're around. And all you are is sowing seed. You don't have to make the harvest. It's sowing and watering. God brings the increase. So Jesus Christ didn't do miracles of himself. He says that the works that I do, it's the Father who dwells in me that does them. How? Through agency of Holy Spirit. So the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. What are you doing with him? This isn't blasphemy. This is biblically. Jesus was fully God, yet fully man. Laid his rights aside to do things as God and he limited himself and he did what he did as a man to model what Christianity was supposed to look like. Here's the catch. Jesus modeled what it was to look like for a Christian to walk in union with the Father. Fully washed by his blood and fully dependent on the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? That means that right now I don't have the right I don't have the right to change the mission. I don't have the right, no matter what field I'm in, no matter what job I've got, no matter if I'm a worship leader, if I'm a school teacher, I do not have the right to change the mission. The mission, the mission is go and preach the gospel of the kingdom, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out devils. Freely receive, now freely go give. What's the mission? The mission is 1 John 3, 8. For this reason, Jesus was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. What's the mission? To make sure that you end the devil's barrage attack on as many people as you can on a constant, consistent basis. What's the mission? You fill your heart with the truth of God's word. What's the mission? You don't be conformed by this world and you be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what God's will is everywhere you go. What's the mission? Set the captives free. What's the destination? One day, I'm gonna go be with Jesus in heaven forever. What's the mission? Destroy hell. What's the, what's the destination? Go be with Jesus. Don't confuse it. The confusion is, what's the mission? Go be with Jesus. 
What's the destination? Go be with Jesus. Wait a minute. You are here for purpose. Look at this scripture. In Psalms 115, verse 12, I'm going to read a little bit. It says, the Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great ones. The Lord will increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord, who made both heaven and earth. Look at this. Heaven belongs to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he gave to you. People say, well, I can't believe, I don't understand why God is doing this and God isn't doing this. What are you doing with the authority that he's given you? Well, I don't understand why these people are sick and why this disease is doing this. Well, what are you doing with the authority that God's given you? It's my hard cry to wake up and to book Holy Ghost defibrillators on the body of Christ everywhere I go so that you, so that you can get possessed by the right spirit. Because the spirit of the world has taken possession of the church. Come on. This is not okay. It's not okay. We've said, let's just let the evangelist go preach the gospel. It's wrong. The evangelist isn't supposed to be the only one preaching the gospel. The evangelist is to equip the saints for the works of ministry. Didn't even say to equip those that are, that are coming in to trying to get into full-time ministry. You don't understand. When you got saved, you were drafted into full-time ministry. And you say, where's my mission field? Your job is your mission field. Walmart's your mission field. Target's your mission field. Drugstore's your mission field. Your school is your mission field. Nobody has any excuse at all. None. Because when you stand before the Father, you're going to find out that you missed out on a whole life full of adventures with the Holy Spirit. To where we could go and live our life with Him. Then he would live his life through us. Christianity is a full contact sport, man. There's a lot of people that go to a lot of sports places and go to a lot of football games and baseball games and all this, and I am, I'm, I'm totally okay with it. What I'm not okay with is that you can be more excited about someone's football game than you can about being in the real game. I am, I am totally okay with sports problem is, if you're more excited about that than you are about your gospel, something needs to change. Because time is short, and people are dying, and people are going to hell, and it's not okay to let it happen. It's not okay. When you find out who God says you are, everything changes. When you find out that you are worth the price that Jesus paid, everything changes. You find out that that voice that's been tormenting you, that lie that's been tormenting you, the stranger's voice, you find out that you're commanded to not follow it. When God's voice becomes something that you get, that you understand, everything changes. When you start to hear the voice of the Lord, look at you and say, well done. I was thinking about it today. I was in my closet. Like, God, I love you so much. And God said to me, well done. I'm like, God, I just want more. Just help me. Help me. People are like, oh, you need to rest. You don't understand. I'm overwhelmed. To he who's given much, much is required. I'm not afraid of the requirement. I'm giving it all. My kids to burn for the gospel. I want our students to burn for the gospel. Watch this. How many of you saw a miracle this week? Raise your hand. <laughs> Outside of the church. Outside of the church. How many of you saw somebody? How many of you saw somebody get healed on the job this week? Raise your hands. How many of you saw somebody healed at a restaurant this week? How many of you saw somebody healed at Walmart this week? How many of you saw somebody saved this week? Somebody give their life to Jesus this week? 
I want y'all that saw somebody saved this week, stand up. All of you that saw somebody healed, somebody have a miracle happen in their body this week, I want y'all to stand up. Outside of the church, outside of the church, somewhere outside of the church. It's begun. (laughs) How many of you this week saw an actual devil manifest and you kicked it out this week? Raise your hand if that was you. of you would like to stand up I know (laughs) how many of you are hungry for more can I get the worship team if they're still here can you guys come up if you're in this building and you do not have a relationship with Jesus. But what I was saying tonight, you would love to be a part of. If that's you, I want you to come up front. If that's you, just come up front, just run up front. Don't matter who you are, just run up front if that was you. But you want this in your life, you wanna be a part of this army. Come on. Come on. yet, I'm asking you to run up front right now. Don't wait. If that's you, and you haven't, and you haven't, but you want this, and that's you. Oh my gosh, that was good. If that's you, and you haven't come down, and you're upstairs, if that's you, and you want this in your life, and you want to be a part of this, talking full on, giving yourself 100%, go after Jesus, every part of you to walk in the dominion and authority that the Lord has given you. This is not boring. This is amazing. Awesome. Is there anybody else that would say, that's me? I'm in it. These are all your kids. (laughs) Oh, that's beautiful, bro. Oh, your little one came forward and goes, there's no way that he understands exactly what I'm saying, but they will, because you're going to lead them. You're going to lead them, man. I know there's always people that have been hurt by church stuff. I'm saying, get over yourself and get down here if that's you. Who cares what happened to you? Start now. Start now. If that's you, come down here. Don't be afraid. Come on. Who cares all that stuff? Just junk holding you back from Jesus. Come up here and give it up. Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Taking enlistments for the army right now. Is there anybody else? This is a drafting. You are drafting into the army right now. That's you. Come on. It does not matter where you were. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've gone. My Jesus will take your case. I'm I'm serious. The devil's a liar. If you're here and there's schizophrenia and there's voices telling you to not come up here, I would suggest that you just come up.
finished, buddy. He's real mad right now, buddy. He's real mad. Oh, he's real mad. Who else is coming up here? I need you up here. We're going to make all them voices stop right now. Come on. Come on up, man. It's okay. Is that you? Come on up. Saxon, be with him. Jesus is king. My king will take everyone's case, I promise. He's amazing. Jesus, for me, canceled my lifetime subscription to issues, buddy. He canceled it. He just went, <laughs> cut off, returned to sender, over. Are you guys okay? How many people are up front for this call? Would you raise your hands right now? That's you. Come on. Won't you do me a favor? Come up front and spread out for me. Please. Just spread out. We have some staff and team come around. 